should have said to these people because it's a private group of people at the end of the day. It's, it's barely a proxy or, you know, quasi-governmental. I mean, I don't know how Trump was able to change chairmans. Uh, okay, that, that's, that's enough to probably get him killed right there, is to do anything arbitrary or capricious uh, to the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, their, their decisions are sacrosanct, right? It's like, oh, you know, don't do anything to us. That's sacrilege, right? That's their feelings about it. But anyhow, I, I do not want to pontificate a long time. Uh, I am spending way too much time talking on these videos, and I just want to get to the points that I have to make here. I talk about economic principles a lot because it's very important. It goes back to the teachings of Christ when he said, look, you can't serve two masters. You know, you're going to either hate one and love the other, love one and hate the other. This is it. You're either on the side of the devil or you're on the side of God in this fight. That's it. There's only two sides. And you can't be lukewarm. You can't walk down the middle. You have to make a decision because you will go to one place or the other at the harvest of the souls of men. It's kind of like a landscaper pulling the weeds out of your flower bed. Okay, anything you tell them, look, I want this stuff to stay and everything else can go. That's it. That's how it's going to be. Everything else goes. So if it didn't make it into the cultivar class of valuable perennials or annuals, flowers in your garden, whatever, uh, then it was gone. And that's what's going to happen. It's, that's how it's going to play out. So you've got to make sure that you don't accidentally, inadvertently end up with the hypocrites through just this thing we call rationalizing. We rationalize. So we justify our belief system, our credos, our philosophies wrongly and to our own detriment, to the, our own destruction of our own soul because it's going to go to hell. It's going to go to a very unpleasant place with those evildoers and they're going to be ruling over you in hell. So if you're lukewarm, like it talks about in the book of Revelations, God says, look, I'll spew you, I'll spit you, I'll barf you out of my mouth. So you've got to be on fire and zealous for God's will to be established upon earth. And you've got to really ponder, contemplate the implications of God's will being established on earth. And ask yourself, is there going to be money when God's will is firmly established upon the earth and all the evildoers are out of the picture? They're all separated, which is the right and proper thing to do. I can't, I don't think any the most wise people in the world can't think of a better way to do business. I mean, that's it. It's unfair to let these bullies, these unrighteous, okay, unholy, ungodly, wicked people, bully, righteous, decent, upright humanity around forever. God's got to step in. He's got to. And it talks about this time in history where God, he's filling this cup with the fury of his righteous indignation and it's starting to overflow is what best I can tell. That's what's going on right now. What we're seeing is really painful, like the beginning of sorrows. I mean, this is it. I can't stand it. I've had to watch this my whole life from, you know, the war in full, full swing in 1965, 66, flatbed trucks, uh, the Vietnam War in full force, uh, uh, filled pile high with uh, young men's bodies, our American soldiers' uh, bodies, uh, and I remember that. I mean, I've needed God my whole life as far back as I can remember. I remember the assassination of JFK as a little boy. People coming out of their houses. I lived in Manhattan Beach, California, weeping and wailing. I mean, this was a beloved American president by all. I mean, I, everyone liked him. I don't care if you, most Republicans, if they were had a grain of sensibility, okay, then they they loved JFK and said, I don't give a crap if he's a Republican or Democrat. He's a good American. He's an egalitarian. He believes in prosperity. So people that believe in prosperity also by default, believe in freedom, freeing this captive. You see, this is what the Bible's all about, setting the captives free. And the good news is, this is the eventuality. This is what God's going to do. He's going to set the captives free. So you can either decide to be working for him in that regard to set the captives free, or by default, you're working against him. But first, you've got to understand all the, the ways that we're being deceived by the evil people, what they're doing here. They're creating rabid, communists and socialists through crony capitalism. You understand? George Soros is one of the big, fattest crony capitalists out there. He's a pig. So for him to be the leader of the communist socialist movement is it's legendary irony. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Biblical level irony. It, it's absurd. It's preposterous. 
It's nonsensical. It's madness. And that is how these people are. They're mad. They're insane. And they're trying to make us all insane. And we need something to hang on to. I sure do. When I see such wanton stupidity in the world, wanton ignorance is reveling in the ignorance, the willful ignorance, and the, and, and, and the, the acute confusion about basic economic issues, I say, God help us. I mean, when people with the intellectual prowess of a Matt Drudge and an Alex Jones and, I mean, so many others out there, your Robert Kiyosakas, I mean, I that don't understand that high cost of living is not a good thing, okay? And when you try to say that housing costs going up is good, I say, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, California is the guinea pig state. We're leading the way. We're ahead of the curve. So I could teach you a little bit about that being a native Californian living here most all my life off and on. And I could tell you that until recently, last 10 years or so, the majority of California residents were homeowners. Today they're renting, okay? Now you tell me, how higher rents are a good thing for those people, for the majority of Californians. Okay, I'm listening. Crickets? Yeah, I thought so. You see, I'm sorry if I'm being a, a wise guy here, but it makes me utterly nuts. Okay, I got to tell you, it makes me crazy. We've got to be on the same page here. Okay, and the page is that freedom uh, entails prosperity okay and there's no way that the majority of Californians are going to wind up prosperous as they have to pay more and more of their income into a giant gas tank with a gaping hole in it okay because that's what it's like we've got 50 billion dollars a year of my my taxpayer money your taxpayer money going into this section 8 welfare social welfare program this housing that's supposed to prevent homelessness and it's only exacerbated the problem you think for that kind of money they can't end homelessness in America when I've done the research and I found out that you could house every homeless man woman and child in America this was about 10 years ago I did this research and I found out that uh, you could house every homeless man woman and child in America and still have 90% of the vacant available housing left over uh, that's either for sale or for rent. And that's not including hotels and motels. So, you know, you want to stand before your owner, your creator, God Almighty, and justify that statistic and say there's any reason at all, any rationalization, any justification, any basis for believing that's okay. Well, that's your business. But I'm, I'm strongly trying to implore you not to do that, to be logical. God is a God of logic. He respects the understanding that 2 plus 2 always equals 4, always has, always will. And you can't listen to anybody that, I don't care if they call themselves an expert, pundit, or whatever, in this field of economics that's going to tell you otherwise. But anybody that tells you that a higher cost of anything essential human needs-wise, which are few, housing, food, water, energy, that's it. Clothing is optional for crying out loud, okay? Uh, so the point is, is that higher housing prices translates to higher rents. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Poverty, more poverty, more homelessness, because it's homelessness is produced when people can't afford housing anymore. And then even if they are willing to put down their pride and go ask the government for help, the government's tapped out their, their, they, their answer is, well, maybe if the government, if you know, you'd, you would um, sign off on another 10 or $20 billion, maybe we could end homelessness. But again, it's like sticking gas into a gas tank that's got a big giant hole in it. So the answer is, well, maybe, you know, it's kind of like Reaganomics or something, trickle-down uh, economics, where, well, if we just gush it into the gas tank, pour it in there, uh, then, uh, you know, really fast, It'll it'll fill up quicker than it'll pour out into the mouths of who? Who's it going in? It's going in Robert Kiyosaka's mouth, his likes, not just his, but people like that, a lot of aggressive investors. And on this issue of aggressive investors, you take a small town and you get one aggressive investor in a town of 100,000 people single-handedly teamed up with the Federal Reserve Bank, the banksters, uh, and borrowing what they call other people's money, OPM. They got a cute little acronym for it in real estate school. So what you do if you want to be rich, I could tell you, you don't have to read Robert Kiyosaka's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'll tell you right now. What you do, you've got to have good credit. You go in there and you say, look, I'm buying this up. The idea is that you're just going to start an Airbnb. 
and you're just going to be a, a, a run a boarding house essentially. Top dollar, you're going to target, you know, try to get people from other countries that are, they don't mind paying, uh, you know, 100, 150, 200 bucks a night maybe, you know, for a place that's kind of like homey, you know, because that's the whole idea between, but that's so alluring with the Airbnb. So you start boarding houses, right? You start and you just start investing. Boom, boom, boom. Every day you're out there buying another house, buying another property, getting it rented out, you know, doing your advertising, hiring people to run it. You know, you give them 10%, you hire some t property management company to run the show. So you're not even doing anything really. So pretty much I've just told you how you can become fantastically wealthy. But you might be hated by a few people in that town when they start seeing their rents going up, okay? That's the inevitable result of that kind of uh, aggressive investing. Do you understand how that works? I object very loudly, vo very vociferously about people doing that, that kind of investing in an essential human needs commodity arena. And that's what we're talking about. Food, housing, water, energy. Those items, those commodities must be strictly regulated by we the people. It's got to be our choice, not some of the people. All of us have to have a voice. That's what a democracy is. That's what a republic is. And that bailout of 08 was antithetical to democracy or anything like, resembling a republic. Okay, that was a handful of high-ranking politicians that validated that thing. Okay, and who caused it? It was a lag period from what Bill Clinton, Slick Willie, did by getting rid of the Glass-Steagall Act. It was a, that was a consumer pre protection regulation that allowed these banksters basically green lighted their asses, said go wild west, and then George Bush was in there, perfect puppet, village idiot, said yeah these terrorists hate our freedom, so get back at them. The way to do it is just you know steady green light, invest, invest, invest. So uh, you understand he green lighted all the lending, this reckless lending. We all know about liar loans and all this. So there was no accountability. Like normally when a bank, you know, when, when there's regulation on the bank, they are, have to be very careful about their loans to make sure they're going to get repaid. Otherwise, they're out there having to break, you know, the borrower's arms and legs themselves. Instead, what they did with the 2008 bailout is they socialized the debt. They put it on the backs of the poorest. It always hurts the poor the most because we're like links in a chain. And the poor are the weakest links in the chain. Do you understand? So there's a good analogy to understand why it works like this. Every single time, it always hurts on those. So it creates homelessness. It creates death because people die out in the cold because of these things. Literally. Uh, suicides go up. you got a lot more broken homes with the foreclosures and all that, the financial destruction of people. It's very destructive to the social cohesion, the social, political, economic welfare of a nation. And that's what they've done. And they constantly try to deflect attention away from themselves. So just don't stay on, don't stay on um, track here. Okay, they, you know, they don't want you to listen to a guy like me and be empowered. But you can be. You, don't, you, know, you can hold your own with any economist in the world. I'll tell you everything Adam Smith taught in a nutshell because it's all it's written down on the tablets of my heart and mind, just like the Bible. I know everything. You can know everything, all the knowledge of the age, ages at all of our fingertips right now. So you can take a book like The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith and you can condense it into a basic understanding that's irrefutable. That says, yes, 2 plus 2 does equal 4, and I know it. I don't care if you've got a Harvard degree. I don't care if you've got a Ph.D. or a master's degree. Hell, I'm a hell of a lot smarter than you because I'm a noble human being. I've got integrity, honor. I value my conscience and my soul. Okay? And I know the truth. I know right from wrong. I know lies from truth. Okay? And so you can hold your own. With anybody that claims to be a pundit, expert at uh, economic issues, you can also be empowered. Okay, in a nutshell, I'm going to tell you, supply and demand, somebody wants to get, oh, they sound, they're talking over my head. Don't be intimidated by this. Talk it out. Talk it out. If you are smart enough to understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4, then you're smart enough to understand supply and demand principles. Okay, <clears throat> what happened with the VCR in the last 40 years or so? I'll tell you what happened to the VCR in the last 40 years or so. It deflated in cost dramatically. Okay. 
dramatically. That's exactly what is supposed to happen in supply and demand. That means the worth of your VCR dollars went through the roof. Do you understand how that sets you free? All that money you would have had to spend if you wanted a VCR, now you can go in your piggy bank or you can spend it on something else that will enrich you, or make you more prosperous. You could give the money away, tithe it, whatever. Now, if that had happened to housing, what happened to the VCR? Okay, if housing costs 40 years ago were... You could buy a house for ten, twenty thousand dollars median price, the average neighborhood in America. Uh, that same house would probably cost you about fifteen hundred bucks today, okay? Because the VCR with a DVD player today costs about a hundred bucks or so.